Talkers Network, we would like to remind everybody that certain topics of discussion may not be comfortable for all listeners. Certain viewpoints may not reflect those of our partners, sponsors, affiliates, our hosts, or that of our guests. We would like to encourage everybody to keep a respectful and open climate of discussion for all topics, no matter how disturbing they may be. So viewer discretion is advised. why we bring you the Bald and Bonkers Show. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another Sunday night. I hope that those of you who attended last night's show weren't too freaked out because it sounds like this is going to be another freaky one. We welcome today James Brody from Boothog. James, thank you for coming on, and why don't you introduce everybody, yourself, uh, introduce yourself to everybody. Uh, yeah, sure, to go absolutely. Off. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the on the show. I'm really excited mm-hmm. to be here. Uh, I am a Buffon uh, investigator, so that's the Birmingham UFO group, but I've been actively involved uh, in both UFO and paranormal investigation for the last 25 years. Uh, been a member of, of various groups, uh, experienced a range of different uh, things. I'm also researching uh, for a book as well at the minute, but uh, mm-hmm. thank you very much for having me. Yeah, you'll, but once you've finished your book, you'll need to, need to give us uh, the links to that and we'll share that out for you, you know. Oh, well, thank you, very much appreciated. Ah, no problem. Oh, yeah. So, so James, we were talking before we come on, can you, can you tell us a wee bit about your first ever, let's just jump straight into it for our guests in the, sure. in the chat and everything, let's just jump straight in it because we've got about an hour. Yeah. How did you get into this? How did this UFO phenomenon actually start for you? Yeah, so, so for me, it started when um, I was 18 and I had a, a, my, my first sort of uh, UFO experience. Um, literally, um, I live in Birmingham, um, so if you're outside of the UK, it's, it's the UK's mm-hmm. second largest city. Um, I was walking the dog, it was uh, November, it was a clear night. Um, I was walking the dog around the block, looked up in the sky, and I saw what appeared to be um, a comet, but it was arching across the sky and it appeared to go behind something. And for a split second, I saw a glimpse of a, a sort of a shape that it, that it illuminated. Um, I went home and uh, looked out of the window. I opened up the window, so I was looking into the back of the garden, and I saw um, an object sort of moving across the sky and got closer and closer until it appeared to be hovering over uh, one of the trees in the garden. And uh, I saw it, um, and I sort of casually asked that. I, I said, uh, you know, to, to, to the sky, I can't tell what yeah. you are. You need to show me something more. And what it did was it rotated uh, so I could see all the way around it, and then it went over the house. I was very lucky that my sister came in at the, at the last minute uh, and, and saw that something had gone over the uh, had gone over mm-hmm. the house, and I was kind of quite amazed um, by that. So that was the the very first experience. But then, what really got me interested in this was twelve years later, I get a completely random uh, knock at the door, and there is a um, man and woman dressed in black uh the the man was sort of like uh late late sort of 50 slightly disheveled the lady was six foot six foot tall blonde hair uh so 
pulled back a blue eyes, quite gaunt looking, and said, uh, "Would like to ask you some questions about your experience." And uh, and then had a, a very sort of bizarre question, uh, sort of question answer session for for about um, half an hour. And they were also interested to find out uh, whether I'd had any paranormal experience. And so for yeah. for me, that gave me that initial link that maybe both the UFO and paranormal experience were part of the same, you know, were part of that same sort of experience. Can I, can I ask you, the, the, the first UFO you seen, what did it actually look like? Is, was it like a disc or was it, was it like a cigar yeah. shape? Or? Yeah, sure. So so what, what this was, is this was shape of a rugby ball or American football. Right. And, uh, yeah. and it was a case of it was, uh, it was silver with an orange glow. Now, part of that orange glow might have come off from the sulfur's lights. So that mm-hmm. might have been that, but it was it was certainly metallic. It didn't have any discerning sort of markings on it. There weren't any uh, portals or, or anything like that on it. And uh, it was completely silent. And it's one of those classic things where you see it and you make a note at the time. Uh, yes. The only sort of in- interaction I had was that I got quite a lot of static electricity. And so all this sort of um, hairs on my arms and, 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 was all, and obviously when I had hair, that was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're the same, you're the same. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm, I'm in good company. So and, uh, yeah. it's a case of there was, there was some sort of, sort of static there during, during the, the experience. And, yeah. um, you know, and that was the only sort of like physical sort of uh, manifestation of of, uh, of that. But that was that was the first thing that uh, that I could, you know, I have a clear memory of, of, of seeing. And seeing all your years of investigating UFOs and stuff, have you ever seen anything that was exactly the same as that? As if it was maybe the same species or whatever it was that was so, visiting you? Yeah. So it, it, it turned out. Um, let, let's have a look. So. It would have been in my early 20s uh, when UFO conferences were still quite small. There, were, mm-hmm. there was one on the outskirts of Birmingham and they brought in a report. Uh, they brought in a ufologist from Brazil and he was showing uh, pictures from some of the counters that some of the people had had there. And at a distance, it looked like it was very similar to what I had seen, but it's a case of I couldn't necessarily see, say that with 100% yeah. certainty. But there were certainly similarities there and it made me think that maybe there is something there. I mean, one of the things that got me, of course, was that, you know, I saw this at sort of like eight o'clock in the evening in Birmingham, a large metropolitan city. Yeah. I was expecting the next day to see it all in the newspapers and, and everything. And I, I remember going out and buying all the local papers and it was absolutely nothing. I remember at, yeah. at the time being gobsmacked that, you know, had I really seen that or was that, you know, something unique to myself? And the only thing I've got in my favour is that, you know, my sister also... Uh, saw it, you know, when she when she was uh, coming through the house, so there was somebody else at least that could verify that I'd I'd seen something. Yeah, very interesting. To go, I, I got to admit that's certainly lucky that you at least had a secondary witness. There's been a couple of times where all of a sudden I've had what could be you know groundbreaking experience. Holy crap, this is something big. Yeah. But well, what, just recently, I had what looked like a black diamond all of a sudden manifest and fly oh, above wow. me. I didn't even realize what it, that it may be something until it happened yeah. to hit the light of the moon. All of a sudden, I started scrambling to get my phone because yeah. it was close enough. I could start making out details oh, of wow. the craft. Yeah. All of a sudden, the second I get my camera out, it's gone. I was like, yeah. son of a... But the thing was, <laughs> about a couple weeks earlier, I was told by some of my law enforcement contacts that there may have been a UFO crash in my area. Oh, wow. And there was lights recorded in the sky, uh, said yeah. that it was small aircraft, was flying kind of erratically, came down, nothing. I would have gotten out to check on it, but unfortunately my car in the sh- was in the shop. And by the time I got it back, all of a sudden that area caught fire. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's convenient, yeah. isn't it? Oh yeah. There's actually, there's actually just got a break off for a minute. There's a couple of people asking in the chat about you there, Dakota. I think it's because the last night he went into one of his weird trances. So he's absolutely yeah. fine, guys. Don't worry about him. Yeah. But he see that's that's the weird thing you're talking about that it was the shape of a football. I can remember the one that I seen was like half a football, it was like flat on one side. Mm. And it was just floating along so slow. But the conversation we had tonight was actually really interesting because when I when I turn a video and when I turn a photo, it, it didn't show up. But when mm-hmm. you change the contrast, you mm-hmm. can just see the outline of it, which yeah. is fascinating. Can you can you explain that a little bit for us? 
Yeah, ab- absolutely. So it's a case of um, everything that we see, everything that we hear has a frequency associated with it. So whether it be lights, whether it be radio waves, uh, there is a rate or of uh, cycles a second. So for example, uh, things like ultra wave, uh, sorry, ultrasound, audio, radio, all those sort of things, that typically has a cycle rate of between naught to a, to a thousand. That includes uh, brain waves. Uh, you have things like um, shortwave radio that's got a, a frequency between 1,000 and uh, 100,000 hertz a second. This goes right up things to like ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma rays. And, and one of the things I always tell people is, is the, the age old question is, well, why don't you, why aren't you able to take a clear picture of something? And that's because, as I, as I tell people, that within our sort of universe, we have a set of frequencies that uh uh, all sort of phenomena operate at. But what happens if something is coming not from our universe or from uh, maybe a, yeah. another a dimension? And in that dimension, it stands to reason that um, those sort of uh, phenomena will actually have different frequencies. And so you've got to bear in mind that a camera is recording at a particular mm-hmm. frequency, you know, and also the, you know the frequency of light. What happens if that frequency is you know a few thousand hertz uh, different? then you might not be picked up. And so you take that that even further and you see that, uh, imagine that uh, basically at at any time you're in a room and you're looking around and in that room there could be uh, multiple uh, versions of yourself, multiple access to to universes, but you can only see what you can see because of the frequency of the light around uh, around you. And so we kind of limit it from going from one possibility to another possibility due to uh, various sort of frequencies that that mean, you know, that you have only got access to some of the information. So it might be that uh, people are able to see, well, for example, cats and dogs see lights at different frequencies. They see ultraviolet lights, you know, things like that. And so, and uh, infrared lights. And it's a case of maybe they are able to see things that we can't see. So, for example, you know, if, yeah. if the, the classic story of, of there being, you know, something paranormal inside a cat in a house, often the cat or dog will react to it before we can see it because they are able to interpret the information at a different frequency to that to that our eyes. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's quite weird with animals because I've noticed we say it in tones that humans can hear them, but animals will. Because yeah, I've exactly. got a border collie, I've got a border collie there, and I can't remember what app it was. It was like, it was this app that puts out certain tones. But to the human ear, you hear nothing. But the dog yeah. is like, looking looking for, the, actually looking for where it's coming from, which is phenomenal. Dakota, yeah. would you like to say something? Well, that's not really too much out of the question, Chris. She's pr- just probably d- done it because just dogs have a much more sensitive hearing than us. But, well, I just had a question, but I just lost it. Well, oh. you did, before the back, you did mention that you were trying to study a lot of frequencies, especially when yeah. it came to Nikola Tesla. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, uh, so Tesla essentially was the sort of... Uh, king of, uh, of frequency. He, he sort of believed that um, frequency can be used uh, as, as a, source of, uh, a source of energy. Uh, he famously experimented uh, in, in American neighborhoods uh, where he, w- he actually caused a, a resonation of the, of the surrounding buildings and actually caused the mini uh, earthquake in his area due to the, the frequencies that he was experimenting uh, with. And, uh, and it's a case of that sort of work is what I've been trying to, to look at. And, and, and so, for, for example, if you have uh, two tuning forks uh, on, a, on two separate pieces of wood and you hit one tuning fork, then the other tuning fork will actually ring as well because what they've done is they've reached resonance and so something uh, that you hit once will trigger uh, something else and then you basically get a sort of transfer of information which is what causes those uh, two tuning forks to to ring and I very much believe um, that the human mind or consciousness essentially is ringing that first tuning fork and then it's looking for something else to resonate and we get a transference of uh, of information and that's basically is how we get our sort of UFO experience how we get our our paranormal experience because they're, they're they're sort of strange set of 
of frequencies that the conscious mind is trying to resonate with. Hmm. That's fascinating, isn't it? It's like, it's weird because when I've been with people and I've, I've seen UFOs and I've pointed them out to people and they're like, what UFOs? And I'll be like, they're right yeah. there. And they'll be like, yeah. they'll just look at me as if I'm stupid. Yeah. Is, why Why is that? Why do some people see them yes. but some people can't see them? That, that's, that's that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think there is a, a certain amount of uh, attunement. So it's a case of um, what you tend to find is, is that if you have a uh, sort of positive uh, mindset um, and you have a, a general sort of belief, then what it means is that you are more open to experience to experience things so it's almost like you are uh, imagine it's, it's basically like uh, bluetooth and what you've basically done mm. is you've basically tra- trained your conscious mind to scan for a bluetooth device to co- to connect to it but you've got to have that initial achievement now that sometimes can happen completely natural because you know as we as we know Children are more able uh, typically to pick up different experiences. Uh, you know, often, you know, we'll have different sort of paranormal experience tends to be very prevalent in children. That's because they are open and they haven't been sort of closed down. And so often what I yeah. say is, is that, uh, you know, someone that is sensitive will have had uh, a strong enough experience as a, as a child uh, so that they remain <laughs> open and that off switch isn't, uh, isn't, turn, isn't turned off. Now, what also yeah. might happen is that uh, sometimes uh, something happens or you see something and instead of the conscious mind actually hitting that first tuning fork, it's actually something else that's hit, that's hit the tuning fork and then that causes your conscious mind to resonate with it. So there might actually be yeah. something that essentially turns you on and then once that mm-hmm. switch is on, I believe that once you've had that experience, then no matter how you try and close it down, you will always then be open to that. It's just yeah. how you then attune your mind to deal with that. Some people I know that have had experiences and they've completely shut it out and they still yeah. see something, but as far as they're concerned, it's shut down. Whereas mm. it's a case if you've got an open mind and that's and that's suddenly happened, then you'll find that over time, actually, you train yourself and that you can open up your mind to do many, many more different things. I mean, a great example is my wife, who is um, a lot more sceptical than me. But what she does, she keeps me in check. So basically, if I get excited about some things, she'll go, are you sure about that, James? Right, OK. And, and it's a great sort of like having someone that's maybe a bit more, a bit more sceptical to be able to say, yeah. are, you, are you sure about that? And have that sort of check. And I think that's really, really important to have that sense check. But the other really important thing is, is that everybody's experience is deeply personal. And it's a case of they should be treated with respect. It's a case of, as you, as you rightfully said, two people can be in the same room. They could see something completely different each or one person might see something, one person might not. And that is down to their own personal achievement. It's down to basically what experience they've had up to that, uh, up to that point, And that mm-hmm. will then sort of uh, help them to interpret what they're seeing. Because, again, that interpretation is key to the individual as well. Yeah. Hmm. That's um, the cool. So, to kind of stick in the area of frequencies, I've I've done a lot of investigative cases myself, and mostly it's to try to back up the fact that, yes, I've dealt with something and trying to figure out what the hell's going on, mm-hmm. where all of a sudden people would start get visions of something. And one example is what we actually had here on the show was that all of a sudden I started hearing these tones coming out of nowhere. We... We did all the checks we could think of. Everybody started yeah. checking their phones. We killed everybody's mics to figure out which side it was coming from. Then all of a sudden, I see this vision in my mind's eye of a crescent-shaped craft, mm-hmm. like a crescent moon. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to write down what looks similar to Sumerian hieroglyphs. Okay. Just as kind of an example. How would something like that work? Okay, then. So uh, what we need to do is, is kind of, it, it sounds like we're taking a sideward step, but it, it, uh, hopefully it'll explain it. So um, a lot of the work that I've been looking into is around uh, consciousness and what constitutes to uh, consciousness. Now, when I talk about consciousness, I talk about consciousness def- as definition as the transference of information from one source 
to a, to another. Okay, now that also quite nicely fits um, the sort of definition of um, of things like string theory, which believes that when you get to a subatomic level, what you're left with is strings of of energy, and that energy is basically used to uh, create. Um, you know, it can it can transform, but essentially. It is all these. It, it is still a sort of transference from something to something. Now, what could be happening here is that uh, you are being um, targeted with a particular frequency, and that frequency, that frequency, what that's doing is that is actually triggering the act of communication. Now, what that actual communication is depends on the on the source and uh, you know and the destination. And it's a case of dependence on what you hear. It could trigger different things in your mind and um and so it, it's it's but it's a deeply sort of personal um sort of experience so for for example let me let me just give you a, a very quick a very quick story so uh there was a guy called uh vic tandy and he was a a scientist and he thought that um his lab was haunted uh he he'd noticed that things were sort of moving around uh, yeah. and this went on for, for a couple of for a couple of weeks and he, he began to get really freaked out at it now, it turned out he was a, a keen fencer, and one day he looked at his uh, his, his fence, his, his sword basically that was that was by his desk, and he noticed that it was vibrating, and he went, "Oh, that looks like a sound wave." And he did some investigation, and it turned out that two months previously, a new extraction fan had been fitted in the uh, in in his office, but, but what had happened? Sorry, in, in his lab. But what was happening was it was resonating at a particular frequency, and that frequency was called 18.97, was, and it's, it's known as the ghost frequency. Now, why that is important is, is because that is also close to the frequency that your eyes actually resonate as well. And so part of the question around that experience was, was he actually genuinely experiencing something that was paranormal, or was it a case of that his eyes were being interfered with, which made him think that he was, he was seeing something, well, that was an example of a very specific frequency that can be uh, used that will elicit a particular response. And that's something that I've actually used my, myself before, 18.97. And it's uh, quite a low sort of rumbling um, sort of frequency. Now, I've listened to it, to it for about half an hour. And in that time, I have thought that I've seen something. I've, I, and when I say I've seen something, as in there's been something in the, in the room. Now, again, the question you'd have to ask is, is it a case of that is something that you have genuinely experienced, or is it a case of you've actually got something that is uh, that that is basically causing interference with your with your eyes? And then when you look at brain waves, the human brain operates between four hertz and uh, I think it's thirty five hertz, and there are very specific emotions that actually have very specific um, frequencies. So, for example, four to seven hertz yeah. is uh, the theta wave. And that's something that basically is associated with dreams, deep meditation, uh, REM sleep. You then have things like 7 to 12 hertz, which is about uh, being relaxed, your eyes closed, pre and post sleep, reaching up to that sort of 15 to 24 hertz, which is where you've got active consciousness and sleeplessness. And so mm -hmm. this is actually, this is all science fact, by the way. This, is, this, is, this isn't something, I'm, 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 you know, this isn't conjecture. This is actually research, research that shows that uh, the human mind is uh, operating at uh, different uh, different frequencies. You also then have something called the uh, the Schumann resonance, which basically states that and this was discovered in the in the in the fifties uh, by a German physicist. And then what he said was was that at any one time around the world there are thousands of storms going on, and it builds up an electrical mm -hmm. charge. And that charge operates. Um, I, I think I'm just trying, trying to think off, off the top of my head. I think it's around it's around six or seven hertz. And in certain, in certain instances, it can actually uh, interfere with the biometrics of, of living creatures, in, including ourselves. And so what this is showing is that different frequencies can affect us at, at particular levels. They can influence, uh, influence us at uh, ways that we are only now becoming aware of. That, you know, that is being uh, researched uh, into. But again, we haven't looked at then the larger frequencies when you're talking about different lights and mm. uh, different sort of waves and how the conscious mind can interact with that. And that might be the sort of gateway to allowing us to explain how we are um, sort of, um, you know, how we are experiencing these, these different things, how we interpret it, because it's that, it's the transfer of information from yes. sort of destination.
that's fascinating. And I think Dakota was looking at me there, and I was looking at him because I've got to have to ask you this. You were talking about your your eyes. Yes. Have a, a freaking so. Can you explain yes. that more about your eyes? So what, what it, it's, it's more of a case of um, the eyes that are receiving light. They they are basically oper- oper- operating at a at a particular frequency, and so it's a case of it's, mm-hmm. the, it's the frequency that the light source that you that you are getting in, and it's a case of uh, that can be influenced. So, so you've got to remember that your, that your entire body is uh, a, a giant antenna. You have you know you are designed to pick up the five different senses. You know, and that's how you collect yeah. your information. Your brain then is the is the computer that is is uh, you know building up the picture, but it's actually your conscious mind that is so, dealing with it. So, just run me in this. It's just popped in at my head. I don't know why. If you could make up a frequency for your eyes, could you make you see something that's not there? Well, potentially yes. Now then, uh, this this is actually again just going back to conscious perception. This, uh, believe me, this this is this is relevant. There's something called biocentrism, and what biocentrism is is it says that uh, instead of using sort of physics and chemistry as the lead for for explaining how the world operates around us, it actually basically uh, says that it's actually biology that should be the centre of the sciences that teaches us how we explain things. Now, what he says with regards to consciousness is is that there are two so there's two elements to consciousness. The first is the self, so that's I control my fingers. I can move mm-hmm. things around. Now, the second bit is a little bit freaky, to, uh, so, so bear with me. So what this basically yeah. says, everything that we see around us is actually something that is being created by our minds. We can't actually see through the bones of our cranium. Everything we're encountering around us is a construct of the mind. Even the light we see moving around us is actually something that the mind has created. If you look outside of the sky, it's blue. However, mm-hmm. that's your mind telling you the sky is blue. It could actually be purple. Okay, It's about how you, how you basically uh, do it. And it's a case of uh, seeing particular things will uh, potentially trigger particular urges. So I know, for example, in animals, you know, that, you know things like bees have a particular colour of light, which will mean that you will want to then go and, and visit that, that plant and, uh, and pollinate it. But what it's basically saying is that behind biocentrism is saying that the, under, the sort of underlying principle is that reality doesn't actually exist without the conscious mind. Now, this is only something I've recently come to, and it kind of bakes you noodle when you think about this. Because you go, well, 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 hang on, wait, wait a minute. So how, how does this actually practically work? So how is it that your interpretation, how is that affected by, by those around you? And it's basically a really sort of different way of, of sort of viewing the, the world. So taking away from that sort of physics-based uh, approach, it's about basically saying that actually it's the human mind at some level that is creating our version of, of reality. And so it's a case of them saying, well, what is it that is actually interacting with us that then triggers these these versions of reality now it's only something that i've recently started to investigate so i Mm. can't talk with any confidence about anything more than those sort of original abstract thoughts but it's just a very different way of thinking so it's about saying right then well is it is it uh, is our reality controlled by by physics you know going to string theory um you know and going back to that same thing about everything being made out of uh, out of energy out of energy or is it actually the conscious mind actually is what is creating our, our reality and um, and reality is, is unique to ourselves. So then the question is, well, is it a case of I'm in your reality or are you in my reality? So again, there's all those sort of uh, questions to, uh, yes. to, try, to, to try and ask. Oh. I think Dakota's got a question for you here. I can tell uh, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm processing this, Chris. I'm processing this too, Chris. Don't try to pin your business yeah. off on me. I don't know. I mean, no, no. no, so, no but here's, the, here's the thing, right? So if you were living in my reality, you would be living out my view in reality. Mm-hmm. So... The, the, then it can you could bring up you could bring up the fact that we are actually living in a simulation. Then, well, this is this is it. This is brought in very nicely to the point. Now, what I say around biocentrism for for your viewers, someone you want to check out is a guy called Robert Lanza. Now, he is literally yeah. one of the most respected um, sort of scientists in the modern world. In fact, many people describe him as, as the modern you know the modern day Einstein. Okay, right. he is a specialist. 
and it's something that he talks. There's, there's a fantastic lecture for uh, an hour. If you look on YouTube, Robert Lands, you'll see it split into two parts. Mm-hmm. It explains things far better than I'm able to do at, <laughs> at this stage. But it's just it's what I'm trying to do. Is I, I think that when we try and explain the uh, what we see, we're very good at saying, right, this is what we've seen. Okay, this is what we've experienced. But what is the driving factor behind it? And it's a case of trying to trying to get to that back. There, there are questions there that we can't possibly hope to answer at this stage. They're, they're great philosophical sort of um, yeah. questions, but I think it's really important that we ask them. Now, I've, I've spoken to multiple people, um, you know, again, people within certain circles, should we say, and I, I am told that consciousness is the driving factor behind all of this. And that that is, and we need to understand that. And what I say about consciousness is, again, I go back to consciousness being the that sort of that transference of of uh, information. And you know, there is there has been sort of modern um, modern mathematician called uh, I think it's Gioli uh, Tononi. Apologies if I've pronounced it incorrectly. And what he's done is he's created uh, a mathematical uh, model of consciousness where. The human brain, as far as we know it, mm-hmm. basically is the most, it's got the highest phi scale, as, as we currently understand it, because we haven't met anything with that's got that greater sort of uh, ability yeah. than ourselves. And then you go down, you know, when you get go through to insects and, and worms, and they're far, far down lower on the scale. However, what he also says is that when you get down to a subatomic level, that uh, everything still has a consciousness. It's lower than one, but most importantly, it's higher than zero. And I found this a really, really, it's a bit of a sort of uh, uh, warren hole to be to be going down. It's a case of what this, so what does this mean? Well, this could mean one of two things. It could mean that, uh, yes, certainly the simulation argument is, is becoming more and more prevalent. Or it might be saying, actually, is there a joint uh, sort of universal consciousness at some level? And, and so that, that great thought about we all at some level being interconnected. And so we literally move from, one sort of version of ourselves to, to some other version of ourselves, whatever that, that form may be. Now, some people could also use that argument. Well, does that mean that there is a, some force of creator or something like that? Now, that's yeah. something that my personal belief system is. I don't believe that that is correct. However, you know, that, that doesn't mean I'm right. It's a hypothesis that, that, that yeah. is put out there. And that's what we're trying to understand. So, again, so how does this come <laughs> back to, to, to all the sort of experience? And, and so... Part of the theory that I, I, I say is, again, as I said this earlier, is, is the fact that the, the conscious mind is, is ringing that first tuning fork. And what happens is, is then you are looking for something to resonate with. When you resonate with it, then you have that transference of information. And that's then, uh, that's then triggers, whether it be a, a UFO experience or whether it be a paranormal mm-hmm. experience. It's the resonance that you've got. And as you train your mind you are able to experience more and more different things. Now, I know some people that, that are able uh, to astral project. I mean, that's something I've, I've been yeah. trying to do for, for some time, and I've, I've kind of hit a bit of a brick wall um, mm. with, with that personally, you know, and trying to understand what, what does that actually mean? Because a lot of the experience we have is, uh, it, it is really subjective. You know, it, it's a case of it's dependent on your own beliefs. It's, per, it, it, it's relevant to your own personal experiences. Uh, and it's trying to find out, you know, is, is, there, a, is there a sort of, um, is there something that's definitely linking the two? Uh, you know, my, pers- my personal hypothesis is that yes, and there is consciousness that links the two because it's transference of information. But as a case of what it's also doing is it's, it's taking into account that we live in a multidimensional world. And that a lot of the experience that we see is uh, specifically fourth dimensional because in the fourth dimension, uh, coordinates aren't actually part of that universe. Everything is instantaneous. Movement from, um, you know, a, a fixed point doesn't exist in the fourth in the fourth dimension. It's all instantaneous. So that's why, through a lot of abduction experience, you say that well, somebody's taken through a, uh, you know, through a solid object, mm-hmm. because again, in the fourth dimension, you aren't limited to to those sort of experiences. And again, if we were to view ourselves in um, in fourth dimension, what we would do is we would see. Our own sort of life, uh, our own sort of uh, lifespan from, uh, you know, from being born to death, all simultaneously existing in one point. And it's then saying, how do we interact with that? Are we seeing a, a snippet of something in that fourth dimension? And again, yeah. without 
I kind of appreciate going, going through a lot of processes. So the last analogy I'll give you is the TV screen, which is something we talked about earlier. So yes. when you're looking at the TV screen, it's a case of you know that it's a three-dimensional object that you're looking at, but you're only able to see it through the TV, which is a 2D um, sort of environment. And so what I'm suggesting is that what we are seeing is a 3D version of a fourth dimensional object. So we can only see it within our own mm -hmm. sort of constraints. Mm -hmm. And it's a case of that experience then projects itself into different, into different ways, dependent on you know, how your brain, how your consciousness has been attuned. That, I'm going to hand you over to Dakota. Because I, I, I have got a question for you, but I want Dakota to go first. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, here's a question for you. One theory I've seen that gets tossed around why certain people may have more experiences may not necessarily be a conscious tuning, but it may actually be a biological, where certain blood groups say, oh, negative seems to be more prevalent. Do you believe that actually may be the case? Um, so potentially it, it could be. So as we know, in the sort of 50s and, and early 60s, both the Soviet Union and uh, the USA spent a lot of money working uh, with psychics. And, and it was a, there was a belief that there was an unofficial sort of psychic war that happened in, in the late 50s and 60s. Now, a lot of that... Again, will depend on your on your point of view whether you believe that's hokum or, or not. But there has been yeah. a lot of work that's been done in trying to work out what it is that triggers people's experiences. Because of course, the problem is as soon as you work out what the trigger is, you can weaponize it, and that's that's always yeah. the danger of, of that of that sort of uh, thing. You know, it's it's a case of I believe that evolutionary. Again, it's almost sort of going down the X Men sort of. Point of view that what we're doing is we're going through our sort of next stage of, of evolution and everyone expects so oh, what does that mean we're going to have longer thumbs because we, we use sort of mobile phones and, and stuff like that now what i actually think it is the next sort of um evolution is actually to do with our reception to uh, to consciousness how we actually deal with it and uh, i think that there's a lot there's a lot to be said that there will be certain groups that are part of that evolution. We don't know what this sort of final point of that evolution is at the minute. What we're trying to do is, I, I believe that, you know, as you say, there's a missing link in, in the tr traditional evolution where we're trying to say, right, so to get from here to here, there had to be, there had to be something there. And I believe that we're going to be doing that with uh, how we are able to, to use our conscious mind to uh, mm -hmm. interact with the environment mm -hmm. around us. And, I, and like I said, I think what we'll find over time is there'll be the same sort of mutations or the same sort of prevalence which will then trigger uh, us to go down a particular route. Well, it, it, it's quite weird. It's quite weird that you say this. And this is my question. And it's kind of in the same lines as Dakota. But what I've noticed is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but you see people with like, learning difficulties. Look, I'm dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And I have, I, I'm quite sensitive to spirits and I'm also sensitive mm -hmm. to the other ones. Yep. And I've noticed that a lot of people I know, there's people in the chat there that have the same problem as me, dyslexia, yeah. and they have the same abilities. And yes. I've noticed this, in, especially in the ghost hunting world, a lot of the people that do like paranormal research mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. paranormal ghost work or UFO yeah. stuff have yeah. either got dyslexia or they've got some type of weird side of something that's yes. wrong with them. And it's yeah. all... Is there something? Is there something at work there? Yes, there, there is absolutely. So, I'm telling you, personal side, side, side story is that. So, I've got a younger brother who is is severely disabled, and right. uh, it, it, unfortunately, it, it, it is uh, life limiting as as, as well. Right. Now, right. the sort of condition he's got is, is MPS two, and what that what that means is is that. Uh, the human mind, it doesn't sort of connect all these sort of, um, it, it doesn't filter all the information out. So literally, he's getting all the information through his mind all in all in one go. There is no filtering. And so it means that he's really mm. limited in, uh, you know, he, he can't uh, he, he can't talk. Uh, it's a case of, you know, it's, it's a degenerative disorder. But there are certain instances where, he will pick up on things very quickly in a in a room. There there almost there's almost sort of uh, mm -hmm. things like there's moments of, of recognition. It's like when you walk into the into the room, he will sort of he he will sort of smile at you and he, he will try and communicate 
with you. There is there is something that I mean through the through the time that I've worked with, uh, you know, worked through multiple groups. One of the most common sort of denominators is that there will be people with uh, some sort of mental health issue, and, that, and that's actually casting no, um, you know, no uh, dispersions at, at all whatsoever. But what it's saying is, is that they their brains are um, sort of wired slightly different to us. And so the key point I'm saying is, is that when you experience something, it's all to do with the experience of the observer. And it's a case of someone that is wired slightly differently will interpret things differently. And I think that that sometimes gives them a sort of unique uh, insight onto different things. I mean, obviously, there are certain instances where things like schizophrenia, for example, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that can cause a challenge with getting accurate sort of uh, yeah. readings from people. But it's not necessarily it shouldn't be discounted, but it's quite interesting that. Uh, what what's you know uh, what what spectrum of schizophrenia is it that okay this is now medically at the point where it's, it's a case of uh, you know it, there is a there is a problem there compared to mm-hmm. is there somebody that is actually naturally open to different things I mean a, a, gr- a great example is um, is that every now and again I'm sure this happens to everyone you'll swear blind that somebody has called your voice uh, has called your name you'll it, it, yes. it, at some point at some point you'll just go you'll it, you'll hear somebody like so you'll, and you go what was what was what was that? Mm-hmm. And it's a case of trying to interpret what it is now. Uh, Terry Waite, I don't know if people will be aware of who, of who he is, but he was a hostage negotiator. He was very very famous for uh, bringing out a number of, uh, of hostages. And at one at one point, he himself became a hostage. Now, what happened with him? He was talking about the fact that uh, basically he spent a large amount of time with a, a sack over his head, and so he was actually uh, deprived of a lot of his. Uh, a lot of his senses. And what he said is, is, is that it started, the, the, the time he realised he had a challenge was that when he started to hear music in his head, uh, music got louder and louder. And what it was to do with was the fact that the human mind was actually starved of, uh, of senses. So what it was doing was it was creating its own stimulation. So again, so you look at a, a one extreme example where the mind itself is creating its own stimulation. It's a case of saying, right then, well, is it possible that that need for stimulation is what can also sometimes trigger paranormal or UFO uh, experiences? Is it a case of uh, there is some element of the mind or some part of the mind that actually needs to be actively engaged? And what that will do is it will actually force it to actually look out and look for stuff. That's fascinating. Again, it asks a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's, I, I'm, I don't know. Say, I'll get a hand you over to Dakota. I was, I was thinking, you know, speaking of, from personal experience, obviously I didn't have any sort of mentors that were experienced yeah. with paranormal. Yeah, they may have heard like, oh, this place is haunted, This that place is haunted, blah, 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 blah. For the longest time, I... And honestly, that fear kind of still lingers, even though I found a way to start getting tangible evidence that something yeah. is happening, that there may be some sort of form of schizophrenia. Then I actually found out, but because due to some criminal situations, I was estranged from my father's side of the family. Mm-hmm. I actually found out that I have a grandmother, my father's mother, who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. We finally got into contact. All of a sudden, she started rambling off details about things I went through that she should have had no way of knowing. Yep, yep. But that was my convince. So was like I was told by certain family members, "Oh, she speaks to angels." Others say she's schizophrenic. I'm just like, ah. Uh. Yeah, it, it's, it's incredibly different one because it's also something that that really deserves a real sense of uh, you know respect. And understanding mm. and not to you know jump to any sort of rash conclusions either way because I think it is it is a really really fine line between there you know between there actually you know literally there, there being uh, uh, some sort of issue there and actually genuinely do something and, and also one of the things I'm quite interested in and I don't know how necessarily I'd research this in a meaningful way is that looking at people with dementia and looking at mm. how the sort of the mind changes how it works and how it interprets information whether there is any sort of uh, prevalence of uh, paranormal activity in people that are suffering from dementia but again this would have to be done with a huge amount of 
respect and mm -hmm. you know like, be so careful with all sort of comp uh, implications of that but it's it's one of those questions about you know how is it that the human mind is, is is wired and how big a part that is in what and how people experience <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm still, on, I'm, I'm still on this, this, this about what if someone, right, right, just listen to me, just listen yeah, to right. this, right, right. You're in a household, say there's about six people in that household. One of that yeah. person thinks that they see a ghost, right, yeah. right. They think about that just so much. They keep thinking about that, thinking about that. Does that bring that into reality for everybody else in the house, even though they don't believe that? What I'm saying is, is he maybe or she's putting out like maybe a frequency that the other well, household members are picking it up, and then they're like, "Oh my God, yeah. there's a I just seen a nun walk through my room," so but it's because of the person in the next room thinking about it. I can give you, can give you a really, really good experience, uh, example of this. So uh, when I was uh, when I was at u university, uh, I basically shared a house with five of the guys. And right. uh, now they knew that I, I, I uh, at that time, you know, I, I'd had a couple of experiences yeah. and I foolishly shared that. And so, of course, they all took the mick out of me, as, as, you, as you expect, right, OK? But it's a case of what, so what happened for me, though, was that uh, basically one night I woke up um, and there was this large, dark shadow standing at the bottom of my bed. And I did the really brave thing of putting my head under the duvet and going, go away, please. And he went away. The second night it happened, and this this was going to freak me out, and, did, and I did the same thing. Mm. And then the third time it happened, I just went right. What? What is it? What is it you want now? Then, what happened was that that night, and this is the, you always have to be very careful with this sort of thing. Is, is that I had a, a dream, and this dream uh, basically this voice said to me, "Open the open the door." And I said, "No, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to open the door because I knew mm. it was this this shadow behind behind the, the sort of door." Yeah. Anyway, yeah, long story short, I opened up the door and it was this uh, girl with um, sort of blonde hair, white, white sort of dress, and she was smiling at me. And I said, right, now that I know you what you are, I'm not frightened anymore. And when I woke up, uh, there was uh, well, what I believed was this girl standing at the side of the bed for, for maybe 10, 15 seconds. And she mm -hmm. went and I got hit <clears> with this <throat> unbelievable feeling of euphoria. Now, now that in itself... Pull that to one side, purely subjectively, sorry, purely yeah. objectively. Right, you've had a dream, it's a waking dream, you've just woken up. Yeah. Now then, within that, ha within that house, I didn't say anything, uh, but one of my housemate's girlfriends freaked out one night because she said that she saw this girl walking down the stairs. And I went, right, okay, so uh, anyhow, and this happened through, through the year that we're in the house, each person in the end had their own experience with seeing someone uh, around around the house and it, it interpreted it, its ways and different things but two days before we moved house and you can't make this up uh we get a knock on the door and uh the very first owner of the house uh, he, he was a really old gentleman and he had his mm -hmm. his son who was like would be my age now so like you know i'm 48 mm -hmm. and he said we used to live here would you mind if i came in because i just want to show my son what it was he used to live uh what he used to uh what he used to be like and we walked around the house and everything, and all and all the all the guys were there because we were just packing up our things. And he came around and said, "Oh, thank you ever so much." He was there for about fifteen minutes, and he and I, I, just before he left, I said, "Right, I've got to ask you a question. I'm going to feel a bit of an idiot for asking this question, but did anything strange used to happen in this house?" And he went, he smiled and went, "What you mean, the little girl used to walk around the house?" And I kind of looked at everyone and went, "See, I told you, I told you there was there, there was something there." Yeah. <laughs> That was quite a, that was quite a sort of validating moment for him because yeah. this, this is a complete stranger that's come into the house and has, has literally without without you know without prompting has said what it was that they saw. But what I believe is there is that what happens is when people live together uh, for uh, a certain amount of time, what happens yeah. is you build up a joint, uh, you almost you, a, a sort of joint link. Now this is a joint link. Now what this is, mm -hmm. this is actually primeval. Because what happens is, is that basically when we were cavemen, okay, or cave people, we were ba we were basically in caves, and what we what we were told is to uh, sense something that might be in the cave that's going to want to eat us, okay. And so what happens is, if somebody walks into a room, okay, and your back's to the door, you immediately mm -hmm. know they've walked in. You immediately know instinctively they've walked in because they're they every everything has electromagnetic sort of uh, mm -hmm. field around it, and this is what you, this is what you, you you pick up on. And what I believe is is that uh, when you uh, live with with other people, 
that you kind of almost you almost sort of sync up at, at, at some sort of subconscious level. So often uh, when you are living together, you can experience things that you wouldn't necessarily. Do. In fact, it, it's, it's almost mm-hmm. like a magnification effect. So for those of you that have ever been to a, um, you know, to, to a circle or to a spiritual church, often there is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I attended one just, just uh, for, for, for a, a few months. And what I found within that circle of about 15 people is that you could actually magnify ex- experiences because you were all sharing that same sort of uh, experience. And so yeah. to go, back to, your, to mm-hmm. go back to your original point is a case of one person on their own wouldn't necessarily be enough to bring it in. But there is also that sort of level of auto-suggestion, which says that, okay then, so you've suggested to it, so now somebody else is thinking about that, and maybe that joint uh, sort of thought is what brings something into the atmosphere. But then you also have to be very careful of that when you're doing investigations, because often what you can do is you can create mass mass hysteria, where basically Mm -hmm. somebody hears a noise in the distance, goes, oh my God, oh my God, what's that? And goes running away, and then everybody else freaks out. Uh, and, yeah. and run away. you've got to be the brave person that's kind of got to walk, walk towards it and work out what it is. So I think that partially uh, it's a case of one person, if they trigger something in someone else, then collectively yeah. you would potentially be able to bring it in. I think yeah. that uh, undoubtedly when people, especially on things like UFO watches, it's a case if you get multiple like-minded people together, it's almost like a beacon that's, be, that's being created. And it's a case mm-hmm. of as long, as long as you have that... I guess if you have that right sort of joint frequency, as, as, as it were, because you you're almost like resonating with each other as a group, and then that, that can act as a more powerful force and give you maybe yeah. uh, you know, more ability as a group. I mean, certainly from a personal experience, you know, my, my limited sort of, um, sort, of, sort of paranormal you know, direct experience, I've I found that having more people there can actually help as long as you're not actually yeah. striving it with that, oh, did you hear that sort of conversation? It's a case of, actually seeing something collectively without the prompt. That's mm-hmm. the key point. <laughs> it certainly we brings did. a lot of stuff into question. And Chris may actually have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about because what? the situation with my daughter. Not sure. That, so basically, it just rings true for me because it's kind of make a long story short. Okay. Supernatural events have been part of my life for nearly as long as I can remember. I was one of those kids who could tell who was on the other end of the phone before it actually rang. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By the time I started going into puberty, about 12 years old, a lot of stuff was going on in my life at that time, and I was led to a point where I tried to take my own life. Okay. All of a sudden, something stopped it, or either it happened, but something intervened just enough to get my attention. I was in this blue void. All of a sudden, this man walks up to me and says, Dakota, there's someone here to see you. He steps aside. All of a sudden, there's this little girl. First thing I notice, this little girl looks a lot like me. She runs up to me and says, Daddy, please don't do it. Now, often this little girl would personally appear to me. Then all of a sudden, a situation we're going on what now? Two years ago now, Chris, when this yeah. happened. Right about that, yeah. We were part of a paranormal investigation group mm-hmm. that is trying to revive itself, but pretty much broke up yeah. not too long ago. We started looking into an entity known as the Hat Man, okay. because very, very violent. There's been a couple instances where he was seen around certain violent deaths. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, we were doing a stream like this. The Hat Man goes to show up, starts picking off people on screen. There's video of this. I mm-hmm. Even though the channel was mm-hmm. taken down, I have a copy because potentially first ever case of international demonic possession. It was moving mm-hmm. in between. I was, near the, between. I, did, I was near the earth on that live, but I was watching it. But he mm-hmm. was one of the people that was affected. And there's someone in the chat who was also there who also got a mm-hmm. pretty good brunt of it. Yeah. There's a couple situations where, I say one lady, she had been so affected by it that she had to get mental health assistance. Yeah. She thought the grid. 
another gentleman who was dealing on and off with cancer treatments. Yeah. He got most affected, got possessed to where you could physically see his face start changing on the screen. His cancer started coming back. Mm -hmm. Slowly but surely, we started working on stuff to break the ties, get everybody back. All of a sudden, this is where the 20 people I mentioned earlier that all of a sudden blame me for getting heightened experiences (laughs) all started saying, hey, because some of them knew briefly about the story. Some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. They all came to me and said, hey, there's this little girl that keeps showing up. And it Mm -hmm. seems like whenever she showed up Mm -hmm. and there may have been others with her, they just couldn't tell. They started breaking the ties. Everybody started getting getting Mm -hmm. better. Mm Mm-hmm. I was able to get enough information to where I was able to use artificial intelligence Mm -hmm. to create an image of this child. Mm -hmm. Let's just say had some of them not been wearing glasses, the Mm -hmm. accuracy of the image was enough to where their eyes would have popped out of their sockets. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, you pull a picture of me when I was about three years old, set it next to it, spitting image. And it was a me- medium of who suggested, you know, she looked yeah. at me and says, Dakota, your daughter looks Pleiadian. It's like, what, you're telling me I had sex with an alien and I don't remember? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, it's like, it's like, like I say, it's been enough to where it was 15, 20 people, thousands of miles apart. I mean, yeah. just as an example, Chris and I, we've never met in person. Yeah, just yeah. as an example, and he's ha- had an experience that bounced well, back yeah. to me. Mm. Yeah. So, well, it's, like I said, what you just said is just like, is that a case where? Oh, oh! Did I finished? accidentally manifest? Maybe it will help find somebody who is very similar. <laughs> find out who the girl's daughter is. Yeah. Or do I have some sort of outside of assistance that I just didn't realize at the time? So. Okay, okay, that's that, that, that's interesting because what what you're also then doing is, is bringing in the the case of the of the sort of spirit guide, spirit sort of uh, being, uh, and what what I believe on that. Well, there, there's two there's two things here. First of all, um, I've been in um, a couple of situations where I've been called out to uh, a private house as as part of other paranormal groups, and. What I what I tell people is uh, is that to deal with something that is negative, quote unquote, mm-hmm. it's a case of is uh, you have to remember that you have the power in that situation, even when it's the case of it, it you, you're really feeling up against it. It's a case of that is the that is basically trying to change your thought process, trying to change. The direction that you are, you, your conscious mind is going. I, I strongly believe that it is the intent of the words that you say that actually channels your mind to deal to deal with that. And it's a case of if you are in a group that is being collectively influenced, that group can also flip that round, turn it back, and actually take control of that situation back. I know. I, I, I strongly believe that. When you have that, when you have that group, you may be influenced because people want to uh, divert your uh, sort of path from where you're supposed to be going. Yeah. And it's a case of you actually have the ability. As long as you can attune yourself and resonate as a group, you have the ability to turn to you know to turn stuff away. But it's all about the intent of those words and the strength of that thought that allows you to do it. And again, this is basically about. Uh, talking about how the conscious mind interacts with reality. And this case of dependent on your point of view, are you saying that it's actually the conscious mind that's creating reality? Is it, is it a part mm. of reality? You know, it's about how you actually uh, influence that. I think that, again, um, very, 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 very briefly, I was, on, I was, so I was, in, a, I was in a particular uh, house, and this is the only time this, is, uh, this has ever happened uh, to, to me. Um, is that we're, we're in a house and there is a negative entity in the house and yeah. uh, there's about five or six other uh, entities in the house and they can't leave because of this one negative entity. So we basically uh, move that entity um, on and it's it's uh, the sort of physical manifestation of that was when you walked into the house and it sounds very 
very classic that um uh, sorry i just have movement to the to the right of me then uh it, it, it's a case of it was um yeah sorry i maybe lost lose my train of thought there sorry sorry to just bear with me so so, so what what happened was was that uh it, it, it was a case of there was a strong sort of salt when he, when he went into the house. As we moved as we moved things on, there was actually it became the house became filled with a really strong smell of uh, of lavender. Now the last room we went into was I believe there was it's, it's there again. So I'm sorry I've got something moving to the right of me as we speak. It, 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 it's a case of um, we've got uh, we, we've got something in the uh, in, in the house. We uh, we move it. We we basically I, I'm in the I'm in the room by myself, and it is a girl, and it's a girl, and this girl says to me, uh, uh, and when you say speak to me, how, how do you how do you mean that? So if if your audience uh, haven't had any sort of spiritual uh, experience, it's a case. What what does that actually mean? So what I'm what I'm what I'm doing is I'm imagining that basically that this 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 person is is speaking to me. They said they're they're, they're frightened to go across, and so what I did was I created a door and basically with that door i basically mm. in my in my mind creating that mental picture i took the girl by the hand and i walked her up to the door and i said i can't take you through the door but i can take you up to the door she opened the door and uh, the door opened and then uh, a woman put her hand out and took her took her across and again the room then just filled with sort of uh, the smell of lav- lavender again and i was yeah. but then literally when there was that sort of that that sort of physical sort of walking across in, in, in that mental image, it was a case of I was then just drained. Just I mean, apps, I I could barely stand, uh, and I've never experienced anything like that. I don't think I'd like to experience it again, to be honest with you. But it, the, the challenge I have with that is when you're trying to explain to somebody who's the sceptic mind, then what you would what you would argue is you say, okay, then so has there been some sort of group hysteria there? Is it a case of that you you know um, from from all the sort of walking around that you might have suddenly just got uh, chronic fatigue? So that's how that's affected you. And it's trying to think logically how that works. But what I'm what I'm going back to is it's the strength of the thought and it's the strength of the of the visual image that you that you create. And so I think there is a real blurring between the conscious mind and reality. Because I found with that sort of picture in my mind, I I believe uh, that I was able to help somebody to go across but if you're a skeptic how can you how can you sort of uh, explain you know how, how can i sort of uh, confirm that, that has happened the simple answer is i can't but what it is is it is that is a purely subjective experience down to the individual at that particular at that particular time that's how i interpreted what happened and through my viewpoint that's what i believe happened whether it did or didn't that's mm. something i can't confirm but that's what yeah, that's I think a lot of what we have to do, and I think that's the problem that because a lot of it is such a personal experience, yeah. it's very difficult to explain that to somebody without thinking what, what, what are you talking about? You know, it's it's about have they got the same context? And this is another key point that people have to have a context behind their experience to be able to be part of it to understand what it is they're actually being asked to do. And I believe that's also an important piece as well. So part of this is about trying to create hypotheses which people can uh, look at, can either think, okay, you've made some interesting points, so I might look and review that. And that's that's all I ask. So from my experience, from my personal experience, all I'm asking is to listen to some of what I've said and then to go and do your own research. You know, so look at look yeah. at biocentrism, look at string theory, look at look at resonance, look at Tesla. Because this is all out there, this is all open, yeah. and all it is is giving you some context that might then help you to experience things and might help you to widen your own viewpoints. That's all I ask. Yeah. So, Dakota, do you have a question before the end of the show? Because that's a an hour up. So. <laughs> that's a uh, phone that's Yeah, no, I, I, was, I swear I blinked and already 20 minutes went by when we first started this thing. Yeah, but. yeah. So many more questions, so little time. But, but I, I got to admit, this has probably been one of our more interesting episodes. It certainly been. gives a lot to think about. Yeah, it, it's been absolutely amazing, James. Thank well, no, you. Seriously, re- really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you like to give a plug out to any location? Your YouTube, Facebook, anywhere? Uh, well, what well, is yeah, sure. So I, I have my own small sort of uh, face group site, which is uh, if you just uh, well, my my website is www dot 
Paral Noya, so that's P A R A L N O I A dot co dot UK. Just look on Facebook for Paral Noya. It's a small group, more than welcome to join. And like I said, all I'm doing is just asking questions. You know, so thank you very much. You, well, well, all the links will be below. We'll add them to this. Um, I'm going to join your group tonight because I, I, I find it fascinating. And we'll need to get you back on the show sometime again in oh, the brilliant. near future. Thank you. Yep. Dakota, do you have any announcements or anything you want to say before the end of the show? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you for everybody who joined us. Thank you to our the so many people that keep bouncing yeah. in lately. We're this company starting to get skyrocket to the places already that none of us ever expected. I do want to give a quick shout out to uh, those who have recently auditioned for the new UFO documentary trailer that's going to be coming up yeah. here soon. Over 200 applications that I got to go wow. through, so that's going to be fun. But yep. it definitely goes to show that this is a topic that certainly a lot of people are wanting to get more on. And as you can probably figure, James, we already have kind of a yeah. – we may have an interesting sort of bias to it, but we try to remain objective so that way we're not totally crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, when you go, Fine. no, I was just gonna say uh, thanks again, everybody. Uh, Much I'm love, good. be safe. Yep, and have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next uh, Friday, and uh, catch you all soon. I'll talk to you behind the scenes, James. Catch yeah, you later, you. dudes. Take see care. you guys. Later. Bye.